When I was 19 years old, my brother and I took a trip to D.C. to peruse the museums and architecture and see if we could find the phoenix that was submitted for the national bird on the American seal. I also brought an illustrated edition of the Virginia textbook of Freemasonry. While I was not a Freemason at that time, and wouldn't be for another five or six years, and should not have actually possessed the book, it came into my hands and I sought to make the best use of it. So walking around D.C. with the canonical Masonic symbols, I saw the same symbols inscribed on the buildings and painted within the Library of Congress, on accolades and arches, fountains and statues, and soon enough they were everywhere and I couldn't believe how surrounded I'd become by a world of symbols that I'd rarely thought to look into. Impelled to get to the bottom of this, and not trusting the various conspiratorial voices that make all of Freemasonry out to be a band of world government autocrats or black magic cultists, I picked up a number of books and eventually found my way to The Secret Architecture of Our Nation's Capital, written by the Freemason and scholar David Ovison. And sure enough, I discovered that the Masonic influence on the architecture and various symbolic displays in Washington, D.C. were well documented and of far more interest than the kind of speculation that scratches the surface without uncovering a lead. The most blatant example of Masonic influence rises above all buildings in D.C., the Washington Monument, built in the fashion of an Egyptian obelisk and inset with no less than 22 Masonic stones paid for by various lodges or grand lodges of Freemasonry. And on July 4th, 1848, the Grand Master of Masons of the District of Columbia, Benjamin Brown French, led the cornerstone-laying ceremony. In testament to more of this fascinating influence is the following list of Freemasons and the projects they worked on. Also, the Frenchman who sculpted the Statue of Liberty, Frederick Auguste Bartholdi, was a Freemason, as was the American William Brody, who made sure that the Lady Liberty was erected at an auspicious astrological date a tradition similarly performed on other buildings in Washington, D.C. Pierre Elenfant, the original designer of Washington, and his co-worker, Andrew Ellicott, were both Masons. The legitimate founder of the Smithsonian, Benjamin B. French, and President James J. Polk were Masons. Many allegorical images on the Arts and Industries building were made by the artist and Mason Caspar Burble. The assassinated President James Garfield and the sculptor of his horoscope, John Quincy Adams Ward, were Masons. Of course, the famous Albert Pike, the most misunderstood man on the internet, was a renowned Mason. I had the honor of visiting Pike's statue in D.C. before the mob of woke know-nothings in their whining campaign of destruction vandalized and demolished it. The Lieutenant Commander Garinge, responsible for bringing the obelisk named Cleopatra's Needle back from Alexandria, Egypt, was also a Freemason, same as the man who read the glyphs on the obelisk, the scholar Thomas A. M. Ward. The Fountain Inn Hotel, in which the plans of Washington, D.C. were developed, was owned by a man called John Souter, also a Mason. David Ovison points out as well that no less than 50 public statues or buildings in D.C. contain either subtle or plain symbolism of Virgo, who could be seen as the astrological patron lady or feminine spirit of the city itself, especially when you consider that astrologically Virgo was ruled by Mercury, the Roman Hermes, who in both his roles as a planetary archetype and god of writing, crafty speech, and messenger from Olympus, became extremely important to philosophic Freemasonry. This Virgo symbolism is also indicated by some 23 public zodiacs in the city, and perhaps the finest facade containing an homage to ancient symbolism is the House of the Temple, or the nation's mother lodge of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, greatly influenced by Albert Pike and clearly by a neo-Egyptian classical style of architecture. The building was designed by John Russell Pope. While not a mason himself, he based the design on one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the tomb of Mausolus at Halicarnassus, Turkey. Now, I could demonstrate at length how much more of the imagery in D.C. is either Masonically or anciently inspired, but I mention this only to provide a modern example of ancient symbolism being taken into custody by a relatively secretive and esoteric society, which then influenced the dispersion of the symbols onto architecture, no less than that of the American capital. 
in our country which has always served in a symbolic capacity since its inception. When we look back on antiquity, we can imagine the same situation playing out in cities where multiple cultures and peoples with various religious backgrounds melted together, consequently exchanging religious motifs. But even then, in some cases, people from separate geographies had come together to find their own symbols already existing within another culture, brought there by some unknown means of migration or otherwise natural phenomena. The parallel categories of migration mysteries include that of myths, gods, rituals, and customs, not just symbols. Just like there is a phenomena of parallel or universal myths, such as the flood myths and resurrected or redeeming saviors, there are parallel symbols that have often gone without adequate explanation. But one Freemason in particular, a Belgian, published a marvelous book in the 1890s with the intent to uncover some of these migrational question marks for a variety of ancient and quasi-religious symbols. This man was Count Eugene Goblet d'Avelia, and the book is Symbols, Their Migration and Universality, now in the public domain. Now, Eugene was a historian of religions and a professor of the history of religions at the University of Free Thinking in Brussels. He was a jurist, politician, and a grand master of Freemasonry. This book was published at a time where research into these matters was being conducted by masters of their field in exciting variety. Technology had not yet captured or held captive academia as much as it has today, and writers seemed, by my estimation, to paint more general strokes with their language, to include more religious and mystical meaning in their academic work. Now, to disclaim one point here, I want to point out that during this time, the use of the word Aryan was widespread and used both in a racial and linguistic context. This term is considered now to be obsolete, especially in a racial context. We find Arya in the Sanskrit meaning something akin to a noble or distinguished people. There has been an effort to show this is a social rather than an ethnic designation. And no doubt the sensitivity around the Nazis' usage and hijacking of the term for their own purposes has contributed to the overall abandonment of the term Aryan as a racial designation. Nonetheless, understanding its usage is essential for anyone looking back into the older research in the 19th and early 20th century. Therefore, when you see the word quoted in a racial or ethnic context here, it is more appropriate now to think Indo-European. This will help distinguish as well between the various language families of the world. That said, we'll turn open this Belgian's masterwork on symbols and see what we can find. First, we get a glimpse at some of the excitement going on in this field of research at the time. Today, writes the Count, we have everywhere at hand in publications which will never be surpassed in importance and in accuracy, the result of excavations carried on simultaneously in Chaldea, Assyria, Persia, Asia Minor, Phoenicia, Egypt, and Libya, not forgetting the reproduction of memorials discovered or studied anew in Greece, Italy, India, the extreme east, and even in the two Americas. Archaeological reviews and special collections, which have rendered so much service to the study of ancient art, have multiplied even in the smallest states of Europe. My aim is simply to furnish a contribution to this history by investigating the limits within which certain symbolical representations have been transmitted from people to people and how far in the course of their migrations their meaning and their form may have been modified. Specifically, the count focuses on three or four symbols of the greatest interest, the Gomadian or swastika and its relatives, the tree of life or tree of paradise, the winged globe as seen everywhere in Egypt, the caduceus of the Phoenicians, Greeks, and Hittites, as seen in the hands of Hermes. Now, in laying out the mystery, the Count tells us, the variety of symbols seems at first to be as boundless as the combinations of the human imagination. It is not uncommon, however, to discover the same symbolic figures amongst races the furthest apart. These coincidences can hardly be explained by chance, like the combinations of the kaleidoscope except in the case of symbols found amongst peoples who belong to the same race and who, consequently, may have carried away from their common cradle certain elements of their respective symbolism. There are only two possible solutions. Either these analogous images have been conceived independently in virtue of a law of the human mind, or else they have passed from one country to another by a process of borrowing. 
In another category, of course, we have a set of natural symbols, which spring up everywhere alike and are fundamental to the observation of the natural world. One of these symbols is the dot inside the circle. I've seen this on Native American garments in a museum in Charleston as well. One possible explanation for this symbol, which I've never read anywhere, is the lunar halo, or the rare ring of light that forms around the moon. This ring during a full moon is a clear natural symbol that could be observed everywhere on the world as a circle with a dot in the center. Of course, the crescent moon could also be found everywhere without the need to determine where it came from. Identifying the air by the sign of a bird or water by the sign of a fish would also be clear instances of natural ubiquitous symbolism. But it is when you add details of complexity, custom cultural flourishes to animal symbols or sun disks, which calls for a more radical explanation when we see these same complexities showing up at a distance from their parent civilization. An instance of a natural symbol that is universally found is, of course, the cross. And when the Spanish Christians found crosses in Central America, this created a great deal of confusion. Of course, it didn't help that the conquerors burned up all the books that may have provided more answers than unknowns. Quote, when the Spaniards took possession of Central America, they found in the native temples real crosses, which were regarded as the symbol, sometimes of a divinity at once terrible and beneficent, Tlaloc, sometimes of a civilizing hero, white and bearded, Quetzalcoatl, stated by tradition to have come from the East. They concluded from this that the cross had reached the Toltecs through Christian missions of which all trace was lost, and, as legend must always fix upon a name, they gave the honor to St. Thomas, the legendary apostle of all the Indies. Although this proposition has again found defenders in recent congresses of Americanists, it may be regarded as irrevocably condemned. It has been asserted beyond all possibility of future doubt that the cross of pre-Columbian America is a kind of compass card, that it represents the four quarters whence comes the rain, or rather the four main winds which bring rain, and that it thus became the symbol of the god Tlaloc, the dispenser of the celestial waters, and lastly, of the mythical personage known by the name of Quetzalcoatl. The Assyrians also used an equilateral cross to designate their god of the sky, Anu. It is proper to remark that amongst the Assyrians themselves, the equilateral cross, as denoting the main direction in which the sun shines, became also the symbol of that luminary, and consequently, here again, of the god who governs it. It was the same with the Chaldeans, the Hindus, the Greeks, the Persians, and perhaps with the Gauls and the ancient civilizers of northern America. But now if you take the cross and sketch lines off the extremes of every end point, you get versions of the Gamadian, or the swastika, which instead of being explained by natural occurrence across vast geographic distances, we enter a more complicated situation. We find, for instance, Gamadians on a tombstone in Belgium, on an altar in England found on the site of old Roman encampments, and in Ireland and Scotland, the Gamadians found seem to adorn Christian sepulchers. But an earlier version of it is found in Pomerania, between Poland and Germany, and in the eastern islands of Denmark, on pottery and funerary urns dating back to the Bronze Age. It is also found on Persian coins, specifically Sasanian and Arsacian coins. It is found among the Hittites on a relief at Ebrits in Lycaonia, the Phoenicians do not seem to have known of it unless they were copying Greek coins, specifically in Sicily. In fact, the Gomadian is absent among the Semitic people, as it seems to be of an Indo-European heritage. It is not met with either in Egypt, in Assyria, or in Chaldea. But it is in India where it bears the name of swastika, and is found to be used in always a positive context, on Hindu and Buddhist coins or monuments, and sometimes on bows and silver bars used as money. And in Jainism, the Gamadian is found as an emblem for Suparsva, a particular kind of spiritual teacher. It is also found in Tibet and in other regions in China. Quote, that a great number of Gamadians have been mere ornaments, monetary signs, or trademarks is a fact which it would be idle to dispute. But the uses which have been made of this figure in all the countries which I have just instanced 
the nature of the symbols with which it is found associated, its constant presence on altars, tombstones, sepulchre urns, idols, and priestly vestments, besides the testimony of written documents and popular superstitions, afford more than sufficient proof that in Europe, as in Asia, it partook everywhere of the nature of the amulet, the talisman, and the phylactery. Moreover, for the Gamadian to have thus been a charm, it must first of all have been brought into contact with a being or a phenomena more or less concrete and distinct, invested, rightly or wrongly, with some sort of influence on the destiny of mankind. And his admittedly provisional attempt to graft the dispersion of the Gamadian from from the earliest sources to later can be found in the following graph. However, it is still a great mystery as to how this symbol would have passed or been produced in the Americas, specifically among the Mississippi Mound culture, where it can be found engraved on seashells. On this graph, it is suggested that the symbol may have spread from Anatolia, and the migration bifurcates, branching at one end to the Mycenaeans, Greeks, Italians, and into Sicily, North Africa, and up to Gaul, Germania, Scandinavia, and Iceland. In fact, the same ancient golden disc, where we find the earliest known inscription referring to the Norse god Odin, we also see a perfect swastika. On the other side, it seems to have passed into India, Persia, Tibet, China, and Japan. But I will also be surprised if we don't run into a situation where the symbol has an earlier precedence in the Caucasus and India and the East. Nonetheless, as more and more sites are unearthed in Turkey, pointing to a very early megalithic civilization earlier than the established dates given to the Mesopotamian or Egyptian civilizations, we might find that symbols spreading out from Turkey is more and more credible. But keep in mind, more artifacts have been found with the Gamadian since this graph, which has caused everyone to change their approach. But the Count addresses with wonderment how the symbol spread into Ghana among the Ashantis and, of course, the Americas. Quote, the same phenomena may have occurred in the two Americas, yet when we see it specially employed as a religious symbol among the Pueblo Indians, we are led to inquire if we have not here some vestige of a communication with the Old World. There can be no question of an influence subsequent to the advent of the Spaniards, for if these latter had brought the Pueblos the emblem of the cross, it certainly would not have been under the form of the Gamadian. As for the meaning of the symbol beyond the idea of well-being, it is clear that it has some level of solar and cosmic representation, and certainly is involved with movement. When you start connecting the extremes of the lines, for instance, then you have your rudimentary wheel, a definite symbol for motion. Some have been led to believe it also symbolized the rotation of the earth around the axis, or the stars appearing to whirl around the north star. Carl Sagan once suggested that a four-pronged tail of a comet could be a natural explanation for why the Gomadian or swastika appeared on separate continents, and he apparently based this off of an ancient Chinese depiction of a swastika representing a comet. But it is Joseph Campbell who argued that the oldest swastika ever found dates back 10,000 years and was carved in the ivory of mammoth tusks. This was found in northern Ukraine. Moreover, after having figured the sun in motion, it may have become a signal of the astronomical movement in general, applied to certain celestial bodies, the moon, for example, or even to everything which seems to move of itself, the air, water, lightning, fire, in as far as it really served as a sign of these different phenomena, which in fact has still to be made good. This, in brief, is the whole theory of the Gamadian. Next, we turn to one of the oldest and most widely distributed symbols in Semitic art, the Tree of Life, the Sacred Tree, or Tree of Paradise. Its prototype appears on Chaldean cylinders as a stem surmounted by a fork or a crescent, and in Mesopotamia, it was invariably a religious symbol, sometimes surmounted by the winged globe, which would in this context represent the supreme deity. This tree in its various forms exists among both the Indo-European and Semitic branches. A tree between two monsters, animals, or other beings can be found among the Persians, Phoenicians, Greeks, Hindus, Arabs, and Christians, and between two human-like beings in Persia and India. The count suggests that it would have passed into India through Persia during the conquest of Alexander the Great. As we know, many Greek-oriented symbols were amalgamated with Indian and Buddhist symbolism in the region of Bactria, a central Asian region that became a trade and middle ground between the East and West, 
since at least 600 BCE. The count suggests the Phoenicians borrowed the tree from Mesopotamia, as the Phoenicians had also borrowed some religious motifs from Egypt. And we should remember that the Phoenicians, which is a title given to them by the Greeks, were very much a coastal people, developing colonies all around the Mediterranean coast on a sea where their trade can be traced back to 3000 BCE and earlier. Considering the Phoenicians could get from Tyre and Lebanon to the Straits of Gibraltar and even to the southern points of Africa and the British Isle, they could very well have been a medium through which symbols and religious ideas found their transmission. It is, of course, of extreme misfortune that the Phoenicians wrote on a material that didn't stand the test of time, and with situations like the sacking of Carthage, the Phoenician writings, which have at times been compared to the Greek writings in volume, are almost wholly extinct. For the migrations of the sacred tree, the Count submits a graph that shows it traveling with its roots in Chaldea or Mesopotamia, and from there, coming into the possession of the other civilizations we mentioned. Now, considering the tree is a very natural symbol, it has taken on a variety of meanings depending on the culture that uses it. The Scandinavian world tree connected the heavens and the earth, and all other realms, similarly as the Count tells us of the ancient Hindu texts. The Vedas make mention of the tree whose foot is in the earth and whose summit is heaven. And in the Hebrew tradition we have the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, which similarly to the Greek account of the Garden of the Hesperides, contains a serpent or dragon. In the Greek account, a dragon, Laden, guards the trees from those who would come for its golden apples. And we have on pottery and in sculptures the imagery of Hercules fighting this dragon as it clings to a tree filled with fruits. Now, I wouldn't get too excited about these apples being too readily compared to the alleged apples in the Garden of Eden, because there is nothing in the Bible that allows us to think that the fruit in Eden is an apple. This seems to be another association with John Milton's classic book, Paradise Lost, this being the same book that confounded the devil or Satan with Lucifer, which clearly are not the same. But getting back to the subject, the Persians were also acquainted with two distinct trees. As we read, quote, The Persians placed on the borders of a lake two trees, each of which was guarded by Gandrawa. One of these trees is the white Heoma or Homa, which, according to the Yasna, wards off death and confers spiritual knowledge. The other, according to the Bundahesh, is the tree of all seeds, which is also called the eagle tree. We also see a spiritual significance of the eastern red cedar in North America, among the Comanche tribe, the Kiowa and the Cherokee, among others. So this significance of trees reminds us that ancient religion often includes an animism, which is the attribution of a soul to plants, inanimate objects, or natural phenomena. To summarize, quote, In brief, both Semites and Aryans were acquainted with the tree of heaven, the tree of life, and the tree of knowledge. The first has for fruit the igneous or luminous bodies of space. The second produces a liquor, which secures eternal youth. The third confers foreknowledge and even omniscience. This valuable produce is the object of mythical rivalries between superhuman beings, the gods, genii, and fabulous animals, on the one hand, who have the treasure in their possession or in their keeping, and the divinity, the demon, or the hero on the other, who strive to get possession of it. Curious similarities crop up in the different accounts of this conflict, which sometimes ends in the victory of the assailant and sometimes in his defeat or exemplary chastisement. Do such coincidences suffice to justify the assumption that all these traditions have one and the same origin, or even that they represent an old stock of folklore bequeathed to the Aryans and Semites by their common ancestors. Next, we visit the winged globe, winged disc or winged sun, found in plenty among the Egyptians and Mesopotamians, and at once a solar symbol, a symbol of life, and eventually a symbol of the supreme divinity. In this case, it is difficult to find a precursor of the symbol prior to Egypt. And quote, according to an inscription at Edfu, it was Thoth himself who caused it to be placed above the entrances to all the temples in order to commemorate the victory won by Horus over Set, i.e. by the principle of light and good over that of darkness and evil. Later it is found among the Assyrians, Phoenicians, and the Persians in their depictions of Ahura Mazda, as found in connection with the Zoroastrian tradition. 
There is also some evidence of Hebrew or Israelite adoption of the symbol on royal seals. And this brings to mind a passage from the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, which would seem to testify to the same association. Quote, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. As the Count tells us, quote, It has even been pointed out on Israelitish seals of the oldest epoch, and nothing prevents us from supposing that, like the serpent, the golden bull, or calf, and the idolatrous images denounced by the prophets, it served perhaps to furnish a figured representation of Yahweh. And in direct connection to the winged disc is the Greek caduceus, which in itself achieved many alterations from its primitive form and later was found with wings, whereas its earliest form resembles more of a tuning fork, a staff surmounted by an incomplete figure eight. This is no less the golden rod of Hermes and Mercury, which was said to have the power to charm the eyes of men, rouse them from sleep or set them into slumber. And this isn't far remote from the solar implications of the caduceus that are implied in the Phoenician depictions. The Count offers some valuable insight here, saying, quote, I in no wise infer therefrom that Hermes was a solar god, or even a god of the sun when below the horizon. With the Greeks themselves, however, tradition makes out the caduceus had been given him, Hermes, by Apollo in return for the lyre. Perhaps the Phoenician caduceus passed to the hand of Hermes amongst those Greek colonists of Cyrenaica, who contributed more or less towards introducing Punic and even Egyptian elements into the religion as into the mythology of the Greeks. Perhaps, too, the transmission was brought about on Greek soil through direct intercourse with Phoenician traders, who cannot but have diffused with their religious and artistic products the attributes of their own national divinities. But another early form of the caduceus is found among the Hittites of ancient Turkey, at a time when any transmission from Greece would have been unlikely. As well, there is a unique gem from Egypt that shows a winged caduceus combined with a club, but this club looks much like versions of the sacred tree as well. But on this Egyptian caduceus, the partial figure eight is actually made out of two serpents. Now, I don't believe the Count ever saw this gem, but he does write how in just the caduceus and its many variations, we might find connections with the winged globe and the sacred tree, especially culminating in the later serpent-entwined rod or winged staff carried by Asclepius or Hermes. And it is proper for Asclepius, the god of medicine, to carry this rod, considering Heka, the patron god of magic and medicine in ancient Egypt, was said to have killed two serpents and entwined them on a staff as a symbol of his power. But if you remember... There is also a place in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament where Moses the Egyptian is using a staff to produce water from a rock in the desert. And later, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake image and mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will recover. So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whenever someone was bitten and he looked at the bronze snake, he recovered. In conclusion, the count sets up a number of the gaps still in existence in this field of research, and the variety of opinions still bearing upon the mysteries of how did such symbol get here and yet seem perfectly independently created there. The Count writes in a most interesting passage, quote, I'm far from denying that there arose among some nations independent and self-governing centers of artistic creation. In this respect, it will be sufficient to make mention of China and pre-Columbian America, But it must be admitted that art in the extreme East was profoundly modified through the influence of the Buddhist types, which proceeded directly from India. We might even take into account a still older element which would directly connect the art, as also the religion of the Chinese Empire, with the development of Mesopotamian civilization. As for the existence of the same symbols found in the Old World also being found in ancient America, he writes, For myself, I am more and more inclined to admit not the Asiatic origin of the inhabitants of America, which is quite another question, but the intervention of certain artistic influences radiated from China, Japan, or the Indian archipelago to the shores of the New World long before the Spanish conquest. In short, whether we start from Japan, from Greece, from India, or even from Libya, from Etruria, or from Gaul, we always arrive, after many halting places, at two great centers of artistic diffusion— partially irreducible as regards one another, 
Egypt, and Chaldea, with this difference that, towards the 8th century before our era, Mesopotamia took lessons from Egypt, whilst Egypt learnt little of any country. Now more work always needs to be done by cross-referencing a given civilization's symbols with their literature and performing the same exercise with a civilization that harbors the same symbol. This is one of the first exercises in comparative religion, and it is my intention not only to promote a gradual understanding of this transmission of symbols or the lack of evidence thereof, but to entice new research into the field, which inevitably opens more doors into the veil of unknown history that predates the established development of dynastic Egypt and Mesopotamia. And although this field is always risky with pitfalls, it never stopped the old historians and geographers, who supplemented their stories of gods from one place being adopted in another with physical references to statues, inscriptions, and the symbols thereon. Now, there is a flaw in not considering every separate instance as a thing that deserves its own treatment, with zero attachments to another culture. But as we can see, there are instances of universal symbols which perhaps can never be generally understood without a collective approach. More and more, the idea of civilization beginning in some specific place is also being challenged. In Peru, the ancient city of Caral Supe dates to just as old as those in Mesopotamia, and they built urban settlements and pyramid structures. Just as well are the dates of the Indus Valley civilization being pushed back, same as the unknown inhabitants across Turkey at the end of the last ice age, whose megalithic structures date as far back as 13,000 years. At some point, we may find that behind all of the civilizations that maintained the symbols we have glanced at in this video are older ones, whose archaeological footprint was wiped out in a cataclysm, or whose structures are yet to be unearthed. It will no doubt be an exciting few decades to come as more and more of this work is done. But until then, we should do our best to get up to speed on some of the foundational literature that spells out the challenges and the obvious instances of symbol transmission. With that said, I've officially launched the Patreon for American Esoteric, which you can find linked in the description. And for all the second and third tier members, I've made a PDF ebook version of Symbols, Their Migration and Universality available for download. You can also buy this ebook or the others that I have in the shop in one off purchases. As the channel grows, I will continue to format rare books now in the public domain into ebooks that you can download for your own research or casual reading. And with that, I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching.